Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m., beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies, and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, offering desk space, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. Now, this week's talk is by Tom Mitchell, Associate Professor of Creative Technologies at the University of the West of England and co-founder of MemeU. He'll be talking about the history of gestural music interaction and some of the technologies he's been exploring, including the MemeU gloves that he co-developed with the musician Imogen Heap. There's going to be a Q&A at the end, with the talk running at roughly 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, please just pop them into the chat window, and I'll pick them out to ask Tom. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. There'll be a captioned version of this talk available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by Ru Hao and Kate Dimbleby of Stornaway.io. They'll be discussing the potential and challenges of interactive video storytelling, as well as demoing their new authoring tool, which puts the creative process at the heart of its no-code vision. And you can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. And while you're at it, please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Buttons down there. Uh, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share this link now as well on any of your socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Tom. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone out there. Uh, I'm Tom. I'm from UWE in Bristol, um, and I'm in the Creative Technologies Lab, where we have a little research group there. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about composing movement. Um, I've been working on a project for some time now that's really dear to my heart um, about performing music with gestures. So it's really nice to come back to the PM studio to talk about this as um, back in 2011, which was when the project began, um, after a few months of doing a bit of hacking, the PM studio was the first place where I actually came to talk publicly about the project. Um, so it's really nice to come back after so much time uh, to talk about it because it's uh, developed quite a bit since then. Um, so shortly after I got my lectureship, I got a bit of funding to work on a project with Imogen Heap, who's shown in the picture here. Imogen really wanted to uh, get the equipment that she uses when she's performing out of the way so she could engage directly with her audience and um, perform with more expressive gestures than just pressing buttons and moving sliders. So we looked at ways of capturing her motion and using that to control her music. Um, we looked at a few options, but we settled on gloves as they're the most portable and practical way of doing this. Um, and we wanted to make a gestural musical instrument that uh, Imogen could use in her performances all the time. Now, instruments are tools for making music. They convert actions and or movement into sound. And the language we use around instruments is quite interesting. So we, we use tools and devices in other contexts, but we play instruments, even in really serious concert performance scenarios, we regard the uh, performer to be playing. And this separates instruments from other devices that we might use that are quite task orientated. And it implies a, an enjoyable relationship than, than we might have with other objects. It also makes them hard to evaluate because things like how quickly it takes to perform a task, which is a way you might evaluate other devices, that doesn't really apply to music because you know we don't, we don't try and rush through music to um, when we're performing. But uh, one upside of working with music and musical instruments is that we get to call our participants wearers or players rather than users. So I work in and teach music technology. Um, 
the connection between these two domains has a really, really long history. New developments in materials and engineering has led to the development of new musical instruments and therefore, uh, and consequently, new music and music genres. So instruments are, as I said, devices for converting our movements into sound. And when we think about traditional instruments um, and the way that they're played, they have a physical structure that, that demands the player to play them in quite a particular way. Now there's obviously variations, but most of the time when you think about a violin, uh, the performer has to perform a kind of a, a repertoire of movement in order to move the bow on the strings, make them vibrate and to produce sound. Now, when we use motion capture and, and gestures for making music, the, the locus of interaction moves from an object that we manipulate um, in some way, it moves on to the body and the, and the body becomes the instrument. And this gives us incredible flexibility. Um, and when we think about traditional instruments again, the way we play them is, is fairly consistent. So um, we have a way of kind of putting energy into the instrument and making something that vibrates, a resonant body vibrate. So if we look at the, the guitar on the, on the left there, um, this is a really physical connection that we have with the instrument. We actually pluck the string, it vibrates and, and resonates. Sometimes we use other objects to uh, between ourselves and the instrument, like a bow on the uh, uh, uhu in the middle there. Or sometimes we have a mechanism that connects our actions to the string. So we press a key on a piano and that moves a hammer that strikes a string. So we have this arrangement here in almost all situations with acoustic musical instruments. We have some mode of excitation uh, and through our actions, we uh, make a resonant body vibrate. And the connection between these two parts of an instrument is what we call a coupling. So there's a physical coupling between the excitation mode and the, and the resonant body. Now, when we think about digital musical instruments, we might um, think of something that looks a little bit like this. Sometimes they borrow from acoustic musical instruments like the keyboard and the electric drums, or sometimes they uh, think of new ways to use technology um, to allow people to interact with music um, in a way that totally departs from how we've done things in the past. And sometimes they're really beautiful, like the mono mop on the left. So, Digital musical instruments have a slightly different arrangement to acoustic musical instruments. We have an interface, the bit that senses our actions, and then we have an audio process that can produce, uh, maybe a synthesizer that could produce string sounds or uh, any other kind of sound that you can imagine a synthesizer making. Now the connection between these is something that exists in a virtual domain and they consist of virtual connections and processes that we define normally in software. And we call these mappings. Um, and researchers often quote a, uh, a famous person called Sergei Jorda, who made the React table, if anyone's heard of that really famous tangible interface um, musical instrument. And uh, he said that these mappings define the very essence of an instrument, which I do agree with. I think there's, a, there's more to the picture than just the mappings. But this gives us such great flexibility. And mappings can be created really easily. And more interestingly, they can be changed instantaneously. So you can't do this with acoustic instruments or very easily. You can't sort of take them apart and add the mechanism to a piano to like a violin. I mean, you could do that, but it's not something you could do very quickly. So we're no longer constrained by what's physically possible, but we are left with a great deal of choice about what we could do. And, and potentially that could be too much choice. So I've been thinking about gestural musical in interaction quite a bit. Um, this is a really interesting class of electronic musical instrument. Um, I've had, it's, it's debatable whether it is a musical instrument. I'm quite liberal with my uh, definition of what is and isn't an instrument. If someone says it's an instrument, like a pair of spoons, I'm more than happy to accommodate that. But for me, gestural musical instruments are, are quite interesting and they've been around for quite a long time. In the, in the 1920s, there's a Russian scientist called Leon Theremin and he created a device called the theremin. Um, and this was used to cre create quite eerie music. So the music from Midsummer Murders has a theremin on it, if, you, if you're interested in looking that up and, and listening to it. And there's lots of virtuoso players around there. One that I'd recommend looking up is uh, Pamela Kirsten. Um, she's got lots of great videos online. Um, but it takes immense control to play these instruments. There's no tactile feedback. So you, you need really, really good motor control to play them very well. Um, and this is quite a good example of how the technology has led with the design. So the, the technology works by uh, how close your hands are to these two antennae, which control uh, the volume and the uh, pitch of the sound that you hear. 
Now, no one thought about the types of gestures you play. We just, the technology determined that. But now we've got much more sophisticated technologies. So we have much greater choice and, and it's, a, it's a much more complicated problem to solve. Now, people have been using gloves and similar devices for some time now. And there's a, a couple of notable luminaries that I wanted to mention. So on the left here, Leticia Tsunami, who's a French sound artist who lives in the US. And she made this device called the Ladies Glove. Um, which she's been using for years and years and in really, really great performances. And then uh, Michael Weiswitz, who uh, set up a really interesting institute in Amsterdam called uh, the Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music or, or STIME. Now, gestural musical instruments open up really interesting questions because the, the constraints are now the human body rather than a particular type of instrument. So when we can make any movement and we can play any particular sound then you're left with some interesting questions and one of them might be what's the you know what's the right movement to make then so this way of performing music is quite new there isn't an established culture around gestural music we don't have a, a learning program like we have with um, lots of western traditional classical musical instruments and the choices we make here are important. So they'll affect how hard the instrument is to play or how easy it is to play, um, how easy it is to learn, how expressive it might be, and how and what the audience experience of that is. So it's, it, it, there's a lot at play when we're deciding which movements to map onto which sounds. And there's a few theories to guide our choices that have been presented in the academic literature. So there's um, uh, a uh, researcher called Sidney Fells who came up with, or he took the idea from HCI about conceptual metaphor and he applied that to music. So um, if you tell someone that a gestural musical instrument works like playing with a ball, then that will constrain their movements in some respects. So they might be limited to bouncing or throwing or the kinds of things that they already understand about a user, uh, playing with a physical ball from the real world. And then there's other theories, um, quite an extensive one is called uh, Embodied Music Cognition by, by Godoy and, and Lehman. And this is uh, built on top of the idea of embodied cognition. So the idea is that um, our thoughts are shaped by the fact that we interact with the world through our body and we have a body. Um, and when we listen to music that's produced by acoustic musical instruments, we're, we're listening to the consequences of physical work, someone is performing some actions and it's almost impossible to separate them from the, the sounds that are produced. So we know that when we watch someone perform an action, the, the neurons associated with that action fire in an, an observer. And this is also the case when we're listening to music. So our embodied experience of seeing musicians play or even having the experience of playing instruments in the past uh, relates to uh, what, what our brain does when we're um, listening to music. And I think anyone who has played air guitar can probably relate to that idea. So I really like this way of thinking about designing gestures. It's quite a naturalistic um, way of thinking about uh, gestural musical interfaces. Um, it's based upon the limits of the physical world. And if you follow the idea very rigidly, you might find that you don't actually make new instruments, you just make simulations of the things we already know. So I'm also really interested in the things that exist outside of this idea, the things that can't be done before or that can be done now with, with new technologies. And more honestly, I tried to come up with the right movements and I, I definitely failed in doing that. So um, there's a video that I wanted to play of Imogen um, doing a, a show at the tiny desk and, and Maltin's just gonna play that now. This is Imogen using the gloves. So you can like have different mappings that will access different things inside my software. So basically, um, right now I am going to just like do this, and then um, I am recording my voice. Like, do this, and then um, I so I've made am a loop. Recording my voice. Like, and do this. You might hear it so a bit over there. Um, I am recording my voice. And a bit like, over this. there. And then um, I am recording. Um, and then I'm going to delete that just by dropping my hand, so it's not there anymore. But I can record it again. I can record it again. Okay, let's go. And so uh, when I, I often do this, and I actually did it in, in when we were rehearsing, and I forgot that I didn't have my gloves on, and I, just, I still did this movement, which has become second nature. So when I want a reverb, I go into secret finger, um, and then over here, secret finger is, is zero. And when I go over here, I've got a really long reverb. And I've got reverse. Um, on my right yeah, hand. Right hand. Oh, right hand. Right hand. Right hand. Right hand. Doesn't really sound like right hand. Anyway, um, so there we go. 
So that's um, the system as it is now that Imogen's been using for a number of years. And she uses the gloves in almost all of her performances now. And it's she's really kind of developed muscle memory for the arrangements that she's made. And um, it's, it's she plays it like a virtuoso now. Um, so what started off as a fairly makeshift project that probably should never have been used live has now evolved into quite a refined um, product that, that we that we now sell through the company Mimu. Um, we've got the team's grown over the years. We've got some really brilliant um, uh, textiles people, makers, engineers, uh, interaction designers, and some uh, business people involved now. And they're all shown on the screen here. And we've released now three products. So the the gloves are now available and have been available for about a year and then we made a, a little um, thing called the mini mew gloves with a, a maker called helen lee and this is a uh, designed for for kids to make their own gloves it's got like a little textiles kit in there and a pattern so you can sew this together and then hook it up to a micro bit um, to do gestural music um, for kids uh, it's not quite as sophisticated as the gloves that we sell but it does have some of the same technology involved and then very recently we've um, released the software Glover which is the software that Imogen was using and this allows musicians to actually create those mappings themselves which is the idea behind this uh, composing movement thing which is the title of the talk so how do the gloves work so we have a number of flex sensors. We have eight, uh, one in the thumb and little finger, and then two in the uh, other fingers, and they measure how much you're bending your fingers. Then we have an inertial measurement unit, which um, is in the wrist unit, and that works out which direction your hand is pointing in. Then we have communications, which is all over Wi-Fi. That's been a, a cause of a number of problems over the years. Um, th we have you get lots of interference but wires are really constraining so we we always wanted to make this uh, wireless then we have a button on there so sometimes you really absolutely definitely want something to happen and you also need some feedback so if you're switching between scenes um, you have a led that will show you which scene you're in um, or or anything any other state that you want to represent and it also has some haptic feedback so you get a little vibration um, on certain events that you'd like they're also been designed for musicians to use, so they're fingerless, so you can still play the piano or, or any other instrument, and they don't have palms, so you can also clap. And the software Glover is um, this bit of software that's been designed to so that you could so musicians can connect the, their actions to their sounds. So early on in the project, uh, this was the very first version, which was kind of. Uh, an amalgamation of some off-the-shelf shelf products that we put together. Um, Imogen wanted to use it just within a couple of months of me starting to develop it. And I'd been doing this on my own, and I'd come up with um, my ideas of what I thought the right mappings were, what the, what the correct movements for performing music were supposed to be. And then shortly before a performance that Imogen planned to make, uh, I handed over the system and she was like, no, 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 I don't want it to work like this at all. So we had to cancel that performance. And then we had quite an intensive period of development before Imogen was going to use them again. Um, so it was very clear that Imogen's ideas of what actions should be connected to which sounds were very different to my own. And, and it, they're very unique to individuals, um, which is quite an interesting thing that you, you can't really have with traditional musical instruments. So we ditched my ideas and then we had some um, quite intensive studio time where I would turn up, Imogen would go, oh, when I do this, I want this sound to come out and then would look at me expectantly and I'd be programming there live. And it was quite stressful. It was like a, I look back on it fondly, but it was definitely a stressful experience. And amazingly, we got to a um, system that worked uh, well for this performance that was at, at TED. But the whole thing, uh, I was left thinking it would be great if we could find a way for Imogen to program all this herself. So if she could design those mappings um, manually without us needing to be there or without any programming expertise. So um, someone else came on board, uh, um, the managing director of Mimu now, uh, Adam Stark came on and he made an interface for doing mapping. So this was the first version of the interface, which is made in an environment called Max MSP. I hope there aren't any user experience designers out there, but we put um, pretty much everything that you could do with the gloves at that time was available for Imogen to map and create these scenes that she could perform her songs with. And it was it was big and it was quite an epic patch, but we then 
decided to rewrite this and refine it a bit. And, and now we have this software that we uh, make called Glover, which is much more elegant and, and easier to use. Um, Glover now, because the gloves are integrating lots of technologies, they're all made in the UK, they're, they're quite expensive as a result. So we really want to make this, the, the, the actual tools for mapping are not unique to gloves at all. If you have any device that you wanted to connect um, to Glover, then the same principles would apply. So we're, we've currently made Glover compatible with an app that we make, which is called Gliss. So you can use all the sensors in your mobile phone, including the touch screen, and you can map that to, to music as you like. The Leap Motion as well, which is a tabletop device that can capture your the movements of your hands and you can again map that to music. And we also made an interface for the BBC Microbit. So if you're a maker and you've got ideas for you know any kind of sensor that you wanted to connect to a microbit and then you wanted to map that to music, you can interface directly with uh, Glover now. So this this idea is of allowing musicians to create their own mappings is what I've called composing movement. Um, and I think it's, it's a really nice thing to be able to do because all musicians uh, that we've come across that use the glove have their own unique idea about the kinds of actions that they want to use to perform the music that they've written. So it opens up another creative dimension for them. They don't just compose the music, they can now also compose the movements that they perform their music with. And there's the gloves have been around for a few years now and we've got lots of users. I'll go I'll just list the, um, the top row here. So Imogen, who you've seen the video of already. Uh, there's a musician called Chris Halpin, who I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, there's a, a musician called Ralph Smith, who uh, does really big uh, performances with two grand pianos in, in big auditoria. And then Ariana Grande as well used the gloves in a tour a few years ago. So we've got lots of different musicians using the gloves and they're all using them in a completely unique way because they get to to program how the movements that they make control the sound that they they write or the music that they write. So I've got some example videos because lots of people ask, um, you know, it's a very visual thing. Uh, it's all very well talking about it, but it's something that um, that has to be seen, I think. So we've got a, a bunch of videos lined up. The first one is by a musician called Chagall, who's a, a Dutch musician who actually works on the gloves with us. Um, so she's really familiar with the system. She helps to develop the software as well. And she got some Arts Council funding when she was living in the UK to develop a show um, uh, which was called Calibrate. Um, and this is a little excerpt from that show. So she's got visuals. She also worked with a choreographer and it's, it's really great. I love the Chagall's music. So another musician that has been working with the gloves is uh, Lula XYZ uh, or XYZ. So she's a musician living in London and always asks us to add, we use machine learning in um, Glover so that you can have a number of different postures that you use to, to control different settings in, in the music. And Lula always wants more and more postures and we're, we're worried that things will go wrong, but she seems to play the gloves in a particular way where it works really, really well. Um, and here's a little clip from one of our, our Mimu videos. You thought I did it wrong, no, maybe I wanted to scare you slightly, 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 
and another musician um, that we work with is called Chris Halpin. So Chris is a, we, we came to meet Chris through a charity called Drake Music that, who work with disabled musicians. And they saw some potential in the clubs that, were, that we didn't see initially. It wasn't uh, something that we designed in, but because the gloves have some artificial intelligence algorithms that learn the particular um, movements of the individual that's wearing the gloves, they thought that there was some really um, good potential as an accessible musical instrument for musicians that have disabilities. So Chris has a, a movement impairment um, and he uses the gloves extensively now. So he previously played the guitar, but as his condition worsened, it was becoming harder for him. But since using the gloves, he's now, he, he has a show called The Gloves Are On that he toured extensively pre-COVID. And it's really made a difference to his career. He, he's more active now than he has been before. So there's a video of one of Chris's songs. I had to cut it off because it's quite long, but I recommend looking it up. And finally, there's a, the last clip uh, that I wanted to play was from a theatre production called Bob. Um, this was from probably two summers ago, I think now. Time's gone a bit warpy this last year. Um, but this was actually, Martin was involved in this project. Um, it's a, a show for kids uh, about bereavement. So quite a heavy topic, but done in a really, really elegant um, way. And that um, the, the gloves were used to control a light, which represented a, a life that then passed on. Um, and um, the, the fact that the gloves were used and played by a, a puppeteer it brought this really human element to, a, you know, this, this object that was just a light floating around the stage. So if you could play the video, please. <laughs> Bob started its life um, at a research and development week at the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, run by the creative team and Amy Draper as director. Um, and then she came to us at Test by Productions in 2017, um, wanting to take it a bit further into development. The team wanted to make um, something experimenting tech and light, and also a show that explored uh, loss, grief and bereavement for young people. So we've been using these Mimu gloves, which is the first time they've been used in theatre. Um, before they've been used in music, um, Imogen Heap piloted their technology in her gigs, but this is the first time they've been used to create character and to play with light. <laughs> Great. So uh, over the last few months, I've been um, working with the Bristol and Bath uh, Creative R&D. Um, I've, I've been awarded a fellowship, an expanded performance fellowship. And the, one of the things I'm looking at is camera-based motion tracking. So 
uh, we, we're expanding Glover to work with lots of other devices. And there's some really exciting things going on with, with camera-based tracking uh, that I'm getting the opportunity to look at now, which is, um, which is really fun. So camera-based motion tracking is quite a different approach to uh, using gloves or wearable technology. And a few years ago, um, to do this well, you needed these quite sophisticated spaces that are very expensive, where you set up lots and lots of cameras around um, a person or whatever it is in the middle of the space that you're capturing. And they wear these markers, retroreflective markers. And from the movements that are captured by all the cameras, you can uh, track the movements of someone in the space. And this is used for film, games and animation and so on. But they're not very accessible uh, by any means and they're, they're particularly expensive. So probably everyone's seen the Connect over the years. It's been discontinued, but this is the latest one that you can get called the Azure Connect, um, which does skeletal tracking using a, a depth camera here, but again, still quite an expensive device. And then in the last maybe three, four years, advances in machine learning have meant that you can do this kind of thing with just normal web cameras or RGB cameras that you have on your computer at home. Um, and one of the first uh, examples of this was from Carnegie Mellon University, this system called OpenPose. Um, but it's still quite processor into You need a, a pretty Larry computer in order for this to work. So I was work a student was looking at this a few years ago and on their laptop, they could make this work um, maybe about one or two frames a, um, a second, which is nowhere, you can't do music um, with that kind of frame rate. But this has been optimized now. So Google have been working hard in this area. Um, they released this thing called PoseNet, which works in a browser um, at the frame rate of the camera, which is really amazing. And they've, um, I I'm, I'm presume it's PoseNet running in the background, but I'd recommend having a look at this website. If you look up Body Synth, it's from a couple of years ago by Google. Uh, it just works with your webcam and you can move your arms and legs around and run around in your room and it makes music. But they've released the library, which I'm looking at at the moment, which is called uh, MediaPipe. Um, and I've got a little demo that I'm hoping to run. Let's see if it if it works. So as part of my uh, fellowship, I'm looking at using MediaPipe and seeing if we can get it to work with Glover. So the hand tracking on this, probably Zoom is making it look a bit slower than uh, it actually is, but it's super quick and it's really incredible for this just working on my webcam. Anyway, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. Thanks very much. That's the end of my talk. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Sorry, I got a little confused there about which which camera we were on. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> thanks. That that was that was fantastic talk. And we have already started to get questions, so I'm going to oh, dive right in. So um, Joseph Horton asked. Um, you mentioned that Imogen has become a, a virtuoso at performing with the gloves. Um, <laughs> Hi, Joe. He's a <laughs> How important is the, the role of a virtuoso player to show the world what's possible with a brand new instrument? Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to recognize a virtuoso in an instrument that hasn't really got, you know, when you see a virtuoso piano player or violin player, there's no doubt about their abilities because if you've ever tried to play these instruments you can appreciate how hard they are uh, with with gloves it's harder because you know we're not so familiar with them but i think that what why i think imogen's a virtuoso is because she uses them so often she on her last tour the gloves were a kind of mainstay part of every performance that she uh, that she made and as she mentioned in the video it's become like muscle memory for her now she doesn't think about doing the right gestures she just does it it's um in the way that she plays the piano or her other instruments so yeah i mean i i i use the term there it's definitely uh, you could have some discussions about it but yeah that's what i mean she's she's gone beyond just experimenting it's like a real instrument for her now and uh i, I just following up on that like how do you design for that kind of long-term use because a lot of you know, gestural things, they're, they're toys, they're demos, they're yeah. designed to be quick and easy to pick up. But how do you design for that sort of very long-term use by a, a professional rather than the, the toy use? 
Yeah, I mean, I I don't I I'd say that we didn't really design it that way. That was that scenario was kind of forced upon the design. So Imogen wanted to use them for every performance, and probably the designs that we did initially just wouldn't have had the longevity. However, through that refinement with Imogen um, and other musicians as well has kind of led to a system that, ha that has the capacity to support all these different musicians performing in the different ways that they would like to perform um, for as long as they, as they want. I mean, it is one thing, there was a, an article that was written about the gloves a few years ago, talked about how, um, how easy the gloves make music making which is just not true because they're actually quite hard you know they're not it's the, you you don't just put them on and then you know you can make amazing music it does take a lot of work like a, a normal instrument and the fact that you have to design the mappings is a kind of extra layer of work that you wouldn't have to do with other instruments so there's it takes a certain amount of investment from musicians to make it unique to them um so yeah it's i don't i don't think i've really answered the question but hopefully that sort of gives you some information around that area. Uh, that's really good. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to ask a question of my own, actually. Um, you mentioned sort of at the beginning how uh, instrument design is, is kind of different from other kinds of you know, device design and tool design. I was wondering if there was anything you thought that those other fields could learn from thinking about instrument design and the way that, uh, that instrument designers think. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I guess there's a the the distinction I was thinking of is that quite often the tools that we use in other situations are a kind of means to an end, whereas music is much more about the process of of doing. You don't just do music to get to the end of the piece and whatever ever happens then. It's about all of the nuances and the expression that happens on that journey, and maybe that's something that you know computing could take on in other areas that you know and probably everyone in life that is it's about the journey and not just the the destination if you could make that process enjoyable and uh and think about the way people um like to like to 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 complete these tasks and then you know maybe that's a good thing so it's about it's about usability i suppose uh, a question here from uh, Colin Fitz. Uh, how how have performers been finding that they've been discovering it, and how how have they been learning? Who's been training them? Is it is it all um, is it all your team? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how they've been discovering it, um, but I guess that there's lots of videos online, and um, it's it's got some uh, the attention of various news articles over the years. Um, but the in terms of learning it, it's uh, the the software has been made to some people can just work it out. We've we've tried to make it in line with other music production software or digital audio workstations. So that it requires that kind of level of expertise. But then we've also got videos online that walk through, you know, what the different sort of bits of the user interface are and, and how you set up particular uh, mappings and arrangements. Um, and then we also have weekly drop-in sessions with, so Kelly Snook, who's on the team, runs these online drop-in sessions where our users can drop in if they have any questions um, or they want to show us things that they've done. Great. Um, so Lisa Thomas asks, um, do people typically work with uh, set choreograph sequences or is there more improvisation going on? Hi, Lisa. Uh, um, a, a bit of both. Some of them are really heavily choreographed. So Chagall's songs are... Um, are very sort of rigidly choreographed, but then Imogen does a lot of improvisation. So they can accommodate both arrangements, uh, whether you want to do, you know, you want the, the music to be as it was on the CD exactly, or you want, you know, a freer space to work in. And yeah, and Duncan Speakman asks, uh, is anyone using the gloves for detailed pitching? Because you see a lot of triggering and manipulating, but for example, tr trying to pitch a theremin is really, really hard. Yeah, it's and, really hard. That sort of, how, how well does that sort of precision work when you, um, you don't have the, the haptic feedback, I guess? Yeah, there's yeah, there's lots of triggering. There are, like, so Lula, if you look up um, Lula XYZ, her, I think the video that's on her homepage is, shows her triggering notes. Um, so you can do it. I mean, the piano is amazing for 
triggering individual notes and it's designed so that you can play in any key at any time um everything's like nicely accessible so i think that the gloves aren't aren't a great interface for doing such intricate note selection but there's a whole load of other things that they are good for so just like some instruments are better for performing you know you can't play chords on a on a flute um you can't play to the level of a, a piano with the gloves however there's loads of other things that you can do with the gloves but some of our musicians do do this um and yeah that lula video is a, a good example great and uh caroline wilkins asks uh, how can this kind of technology apply eventually to uh, contemporary classical music like do you see this feeding back into more traditional um yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a good question. I, I haven't seen that so far. Um, um, but yeah, there's definitely potential for it to feed back into classical music. Um, it'd be not an orchestra of glove musicians would be interesting. <laughs> Although it could be quite naff. We, I guess we'd have to see. <laughs> and uh, another question from uh, Colin. Uh, what's your next biggest tech and promotional challenge? tech and promotional challenge yeah um well this, that might be two questions <laughs> yeah yeah um so the looking at this camera based tracking is the thing that i'm looking at at the moment um we've just released glover so we're uh we've got we've done lots of work on that recently and then there's lots of uh, new features and devices that we want to support in future um so yeah kind of looking at how we can uh take all of the work that we put into Glover and just make it uh, accessible through all the different devices that there are out there for doing uh, gestural interaction, which is a surprising amount that there are, but there, there are quite a lot of them are um, kind of solutions looking for problems. So there, there was an armband called the Mayo, which um, has been discontinued sadly, but it was like a really nice uh, sort of, tracking device that used uh, EMG so it could sense what your muscles were doing um, and it would have been we we were just about to make Glover compatible with the Mayo but unfortunately it's been discontinued which is a shame so yeah that's the that's what I'm working on at the moment. Great. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask as well you sort of touched on it a bit but this idea of like getting haptic feedback and I know the the gloves have the little buzzer in there, but it, it's mm. it's a very very basic level of haptic it's feedback. Very limited, yeah. Um, well, do you think there's potential for incorporating more haptics into these things and getting? There's that definitely kind of... potential. Yes, I mean you could, you can. There's no limit to the technology that you could put on the gloves, but then you have more and more equipment that you have to lug around, so the gloves become less practical so we've we've kind of reached a balance where we have we want to accommodate lots of we want to capture lots of different movements but we also want them to be quite lightweight and unobstructive so that's how we've reached the sort of compromise that we're at, at the moment um there is definitely with the gloves and any gestural interface the the feedback that you get through touch is just absent and I, I think it's really interesting to use this is something I haven't explored in great detail, but I've been thinking about it a lot, using the gloves in combination with other objects. So, for example, you could play the piano with the gloves, but then you could do kind of individual note based pitch control through the gloves. So what's quite interesting is what you can add to other in, other kind of interfaces through the gloves as well. So putting some of that technology onto the gloves that's um, that you'd, you know, using other technologies, you'd need like a kind of touch controller on each key, like touch keys, which is um, that Andrew McPherson has developed, which is really interesting. But you could add that technology just by using the gloves. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I guess leading on from that, like, do you see the gloves as being the the have the gloves reached an endpoint, or do you do you think do you think the next project is put the gloves to one side and develop a wholly different instrument, or are you going to keep iterating on the gloves to make them the best gloves they can be? We'd like to iterate on the gloves, and yeah, we have. So the the 
the technologies that are in mobile phones have just been getting the motion sensors that are designed for mobile phones have just been getting smaller and smaller and uh, more advanced. Um, and you, I'd really like to look at making a glove with these sensors on, but there that takes a lot of R and D um, that we'll look at at some point. So the, hopefully the gloves wouldn't become bulkier but they would become much more, the, the degrees of freedom that they could sense would be much higher. Um, so you'd have really precise control. And maybe you could do, you know, really precise pitch control with your fingers um, as Duncan asked, but yeah. So we have got ideas for future technologies, but yeah, we'll have to see whether they come into fruition. And we do have another question from Duncan, uh, which actually feeds on from that. Could you say a little bit more about the app control for Glover that you've now incorporated for? for those yeah, of us so who can't Gliss, afford the gloves <laughs> right yeah no, fair enough um yes gliss um uh, so all of the accelerometer gyroscope and accelerometer and uh, magnetometer that's on the um that's on most mobile phones it only works for ios at the moment um but we would like to expand for android as well and then it also has touch control so you you can add buttons um, you can also make gestures on the screen. So you could put multiple fingers down and then that would recognize that as a p kind of posture. And then you can move it around from there. So you can kind of select a, a control and then you have X, Y control of it. And then depending on the number of fingers you put down, that could access a different parameter as well. Um, but yeah, you can download it. It's for free if you wanted to try Gliss out. It sends open sound control. Um, so if you have an open sound control client, you can use it with Glover. There's like a, a a demo for 30 days that you could use Gliss and Glover with without having to pay anything um, just to try it out and see if it works for you. Great. And can you do, does that have feedback to the, can you feedback to the phone or? Uh, you... Yeah. So it uses the like buzzer that's in the phone or the vibration motor that's in the phone, but yeah, it's limited to the technology that's in the iPhones. Well, which is it's pretty which decent. Which is you know, not incredibly powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if we have any more questions. Um, okay. So I think we might uh, call it a day there. Thank you so much, Great. Tom. That It's been uh, phenomenal. Um, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, well, where, where can people get all of these things if they wish to get them? Yeah, so um, memugloves.com, I think, is the website. Um, so if you browse to that, then you should... You can see our all of our different stuff that we've been getting up to, Glover and Gliss and the, and the gloves. And we, we have uh, one final question. You got in just under the wire. Well done, Colin. Uh, if we do have further questions or uh, ideas for applications for the gloves, what is the call to action? Where, where should we go? Yeah, you can get in touch with me. I think there's a slide at the end with my Twitter on, or you can look me up on the UE website. Um, and send me an email or you can there's there's a contact page on the Mimi gloves website um you could send a message there as well great well thank you very much tom great thank you all right um that, and yeah before you go uh, next week's talk is by ru Hao and kate dimbleby of stornaway.io they'll be discussing the potential and challenges of interactive video storytelling as well as demoing their new authoring tool, putting the creative process at the heart of the no-code vision. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link. Caption version of the video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week.